Hello, every folks, and good morning. Welcome to Tactics Ogre Details One Plus One. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm calling it One Plus One because it's basically the second list of 100 interesting things that was put together here. And uh, well, there's going to be some stuff that might be uh, well, might be a little bit mind blowing today. So we're going to start off with one that was brought to my attention by a uh, Kansas Scrim last week uh, in response to one of the episodes. Um, essentially pointing out that you know what there's actually a elemental stacking mechanic now in the original comment it was mentioned that hey summons will boost uh, boost related magic by a little bit however it turns out there's a lot more to it than that so here we have a uh, list of screenshots which by the way uh, if you didn't know uh, yeah you can actually take screenshots uh, screenshots at any point in this game for anything except for the select menu uh, if you hit start and the right trigger it takes a screenshot now okay uh, here's the situation, uh, because upon reading this, I decided to go test it with, you know, with summons. So I was doing the Hades, or uh, not the Hades, but the Hellhound summon in this one. So I started off uh, targeting this fairy at 167. Uh, this is with a uh, maxed out character. Um, so okay, pretty uh, going to be pretty solid damage. They're pretty much going to one-shot this character right off the bat. However, then we kept stacking it. And then kept stacking it. And then kept stacking it. And every time that it was cast, even if it was cast on nothing, it would get more powerful. Um, which, uh, funnily enough, in this particular case, uh, was just confirming that, yes, uh, Hellhound is also affected by fear, because I got hit by uh, fear in this particular fight. No, I don't know why I didn't just go through and, you know, use an infinite turn sheet to just test it out that way, but whatever. Anyway, so it just kept stacking and stacking and stacking, and it was about 4 to 8. Um, there was some very particular situations uh, where it was... Uh, uh, where it wound up uh, going up to 8 for some reason or another. Um, but yeah, it was about 4 to 8 extra damage per stack. And um, and yes, I, I'm just calling it elemental stacking. I know it's it's called predominant element, or um, uh, what was it called? I, I think it was... Uh, oh God, what was it called now? Uh, prevailing element, there we go. Uh, so yeah, every time that, that uh, the spell is cast, it goes up and up and up. However, like I said before, and by the way, this was just funny because this random AI guy just got himself stuck in this island and didn't know what to do. Um, but yeah, so this stacked about 40 times. Now, depending on whether I did the count right, it was about 30 to 40 times. And so what I'll show in a second here, and why I was showing that initial one where it shows that there's no prevailing element here. Well, it turns out it goes up uh, pretty significantly. Let's keep going and going and going and going and going until eventually, you can see over here, we suddenly have two stacks of, um, of uh, uh, prevailing dark here, uh, which ends up uh, stacking even farther until eventually we get to the point that it's up to three stacks. I'm going to skip a few here because you can see it just kind of keeps going up and up and up. Um, and so there's there's a bit more to it. Um, and this, this is around the point when we ended up getting the uh, the full three stacks. Um, I believe I had it a few before this when it was actually at three. So the, the way it works, it's about ten or so. Um, so it starts off at nothing. At about ten or so, it'll give you one stack, um, or at, at least it's like one to ten-ish. And then in about the uh, ten to twenty range, you get two stacks. About uh, uh, thirty to forty range, uh, you end up, uh, well, basically everything above that, you end up getting three. Or, yeah, you end up getting the full three stacks. Like, once you get the three stack on the UI... That doesn't mean it's done, though. Uh, basically, it will still keep stacking a decent bit after that. That's what I'm saying. It's like about 30 to 40, uh, depending on what kind of outside interference there might have been. Now, it should be noted that, yeah, there is more to this mechanic beyond just that. I mean, I'm going to go ahead and uh, exit out of this one right here. Um, so, yeah, it, there's a bit more to it than just that because it goes... Uh, it turns out that it's not just summons. Uh, it turns out, in fact, it's uh, it's all spells of uh, of a particular kind, as long as, as seemingly as long as they do damage, um, that will stack the element. However, they all have different amounts. That was that's what was confusing. At first, I thought it actually didn't um, uh, didn't stack those at all. But it turns out, uh, when uh, Rakes was going and testing this in the background, um, he found out that uh, sure enough, there was a bit more to it. Um, so the uh, the main missile spells and things like that uh, do it on a uh, fairly uh, a fairly limited basis. Um, you have some of the um, uh, some of the later ones that do uh, do quite a bit more. Um, uh, for example, uh, the uh, the tier two summons, uh, the uh, the forbiddens, um, stuff like that. All of those, like the really high end stuff, will boost it by like two to four times as much as the basic missile spells would. That's why sometimes it just won't tick up. Now it seems to tick up 
every time uh, it reaches an increment of four. Again, I could be mistaken on that, but that's what seemed to be going on there. So, all right. Uh, so that was a that was a fun discovery there. Um, additionally, uh, did you know that uh, tiles on the ground uh, do actually have a uh, element of, um, assigned to them? Um, so, as I understand, and uh, again, hopefully he'll uh, correct me on this. I believe Constance Grimm is taking this from the guide. So, actually, as a, a thousand sub thing, since we just hit that this last weekend. Um, what I want to do is actually go and get a copy of that guide and just kind of go over it, see what other kinds of crazy specific stuff we've been missing. Because he was also mentioning that uh, opposite elements, um, uh, when it comes to element stacking, opposite elements will fight each other. Um, unrelated elements will be able to uh, kind of keep each other, uh, keep each other separate. Um, you know, different elements can take over other elements. And additionally, each uh, tile type has something assigned to it. Um, if I recall correctly, it was something like a swamp tile having water, which then turned into dirt for lightning, which then turned into something something along those lines. Each of them has a very minor elemental bonus. It's probably not something that'll ever be, you know, altering the game in any way, but it's just cool that it's there. Um, also, by the way, a fun little note, this build is impossible. Um, well, I guess it's somewhat possible. Um, but, uh, yeah, full, uh, full Ogdark on the Lord is unfortunately, uh, not something the game lets you do. Anyway, um, other, uh, other interesting things that come up. Uh, one thing I don't see brought up that often, um, well, actually, one thing I see brought up fairly often to, uh, to its contrary, is the fact that, um, throughout your first run of the game, so, in general, it, like, it, it's one of these cases where it kind of just looks like the AI is, you know, throwing the fight, it's not really trying, because your first time through is supposed to be your tutorial. Like, the way that they balance this, you're supposed to go back and back and back and back again on, you know, multiple different routes. Get all the different people, go in with your weird A-team of people that shouldn't even be alive, that kind of thing. Um, so it's, um, it's kind of a cool idea there, but one thing that uh, doesn't come up that often is what I like to call scaled mode. Um, wherein, uh, once you end up hitting that New Game Plus barrier there, um, you'll end up seeing a moment where it all ends up just scaling up properly like it'll actually adjust to your level uh, even if you're at a relatively low level it will uh, essentially every fight will function as if you were you know just playing part of the uh, uh, part of the story normally or I, I apologize every part of the story part will scale as if it was a random battle um, so this means levels go up equipment gets better uh, their skills will still be assigned to particular areas uh, but yeah um, if you didn't know um, which, again, I'm a little bit shocked that this doesn't come up more because a surprising amount of people go through it once and then just never really go back. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, you, you can actually go back and, uh, well, see, uh, see all these different outcomes with that same team uh, while having the game actually adjust its difficulty. However, an, a fun little note is that a lot of your uh, AI characters uh, or a lot of your, like, guests and things like that, um, well, they will... Uh, so if you have them in your team, they will use whoever's in your team. Um, if you don't have them in your team, though, uh, it'll just basically default them to their usual equipment, which tends to be a little bit funny when you have a character that's dead. Um, so you come back at like level 50 and then there's like, for example, Canopus here. Um, he'll uh, he'll basically use uh, use the one that's already in the party. However, um, if uh, if you if you had him already dead, uh, he would uh, he would come in uh, using just a short bow instead, so a little bit of a funny situation there. Which, by the way, if you're wondering how he has a lobber in the uh, slot there, that's not supposed to be possible. Uh, this is just a thing where I used a uh, I used a one vision save for the sake of everything's already locked unlocked on it. All right, so yeah, um, as far as when this would apply, uh, which we can. Uh, just go ahead and uh, end this fight real quickly here by just not doing anything and letting Copus absolutely own as he usually does. Um, so the funny part about this is because, yeah, it, Canopus will come in with that default equipment. Um, it It's a little strange that he does that, but, you know, what can he do? Uh, however, when it comes to, uh, to a lot of other characters, they may actually scale up their equipment based on what you, um, based on how you get them. For example, Sarah and Voltaire, if you didn't know, uh, you can actually use them to cheese, uh, like, Chapter 2 and 3 equipment. Hell, you could potentially get, like, full Damask gear or even full Elemental gear on them if you wanted. Um, like, we're talking a case where it doesn't matter what um, uh, what level those classes are at, it will match uh, who you have. So for Sarah and Voltaire, it's completely unlocked. 
Uh, for Canopus, since he's easy to get, they basically just decided whatever. He's uh, he's just coming in locked with locked to a short bow and uh, leather armor. Um, yeah, Sarah and Voltaire are some of the uh, some of the only ex exceptions. So Sarah, Voltaire, Yunin are the ones that uh, will scale all of their equipment based on the level that you get them at. Um, so you can absolutely cheese that to get whatever equipment you want. Um, potentially, uh, there's um, there's some cheese available for uh, uh, what's his face, uh, Divold as well. Um, but unfortunately, in his case, uh, he has to actually fight a fight using that particular level. Uh, so you may potentially have some issues there. Um, actually, personally, when I was doing the solo for One Vision, it was quite difficult to pull off that particular method. Uh, the Union method would have been way easier. Um, but you know, it's uh, it's just cool that you can do that. So yeah, Sarah Voltaire and Union can give you uh, end game equipment without actually having to put much effort into grinding for it. Um, next up, uh, in terms of Vice, uh, one thing that comes up a lot is like, hey, what the hell is Vice's deal? Why does he not make any sense? Um, so looking throughout the entire story, if you look at every single route, if you look at everything, every single thing that he does, the funny part is he kind of sort of does make sense. His whole purpose uh, throughout all of it is that he's... Well, he's got two main goals, and he's seemingly always trying to accomplish those goals. A, uh, he's always trying to uh, to be uh, the opposite to Denim, uh, because of B, he's always trying to get into Casual's pants. Um, that's not even hyperbole. Like, literally, even in the DLC, he's literally just trying to do that. They weren't even being subtle about it. Um, so, uh, uh, so yeah, uh, basically the way it goes is that at every point he's constantly trying to one-up Denim no matter what he does in order to accomplish that particular goal. Is it a good goal? No. But, you know, it is what it is. It makes more sense than it seems at first glance. Alright, next up, uh, in terms of uh, weird things when the game was being originally advertised, um, did you know that, uh, that, yeah, the thing was actually advertised using something that you couldn't even accomplish in the game normally? And for that matter, couldn't even accomplish uh, using cheats in a normal manner. Um, so one of the first advertisements that came out was some screenshots for the multiplayer mode, um, stating, you know, it would have all these different kinds of features, and then it was showing a uh, copy of, um, of uh, Lands fighting Lands, as in, like, Dark Knight Lands, as in, like, the, you know, uh, Mr., uh, Mr. Cyclops. So, yeah. It was just, uh, just kind of a funny note on that one. Um... All right, what else here? So uh, next up, uh, we got the Firecrest. Thing is still in the game. Um, a lot of folks aren't really sure how to get it because it's a massive pain in the neck to go pick up. Uh, but yeah, the Firecrest is in the game, uh, just like it is in every one of the games. It's or you know, Fire Seal, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's basically always been the best item in the game. However, in this one, it's an odd duck because uh, yeah. What they, what they wanted to do is kind of surprise uh, players of the original. Um, oh, whoops. Sorry, the, uh, uh, the recording thing just got a little janky. But yeah, so at every time that they introduced the Firecrest, uh, they wanted to try and surprise people that had played the original. Um, so, for example, in, um, in original, in, like the original Tactics Ogre back in the day, they even had a, a helmet uh, or something like that that you would end up getting if you ended up uh, <coughs> uh, finding where the thing was. So, seemingly as a nod to that, um, they actually changed the location of the, uh, the fire seal, kind of. Um, so, originally, you had to go through Palace of the Dead multiple times. You picked up uh, multiple copies of, um, well, multiple uh, Wind God weapons, like this Notos here. Uh, there's four of them in the game. This is never explained, by the way. Um, so the Wind God weapons never really have any plot element to them. They never have any, any explanation to them. Um, all that it ever says is just, hey, you know, they're the, the weapons of these uh, Wind Gods. Just so you know, that's kind of cool, huh? Um, but yeah, so what you have to do is collect all four of them and then uh, make your way to the bottom of the Palace of the Dead. Why? Who friggin' knows? But... Either way, you, uh, you find Blackmore, who, funnily enough, is another reference in and of, his, uh, in and of himself there. Uh, so, anyone unfamiliar, and I've done this in articles in the past before, uh, but Blackmore is actually a D&D &D reference. Um, basically, the... Uh, um, so, the original D&D uh, &D back in the day um, had a, uh, uh, had a uh, guy that was... Well, not a guy. It was, it was essentially a, a book uh, called... Uh, well, the original Compendium of Different Rules was called Blackmore. 
Uh, so just a fun little uh, little side note there. Um, additionally, what else we got on this list? Uh, did you know there's uh, zombie versions of Vice and uh, a few of the other knights? Uh, so uh, Vice, uh, Lenar, and Zabos can actually show up as zombies. Um, there's specific uh, uh, plot situations that have to happen to make it happen. Um, but yeah, you can uh, find them in Palace of the Dead as well as uh, Cressida's side quest. So that's a little uh, little fun note there. Um, additionally, uh, did you know uh, when it comes to the clerics, it always seems like a little bit of a weird thing that they're so respected in the lore and why they're always uh, uh, holding high-ranking offices. Um, but there's actually a legitimate plot reason for that. <laughs> because, yeah, the class itself might not be very good, and that's more than likely on purpose because, well, healing in this game in general is just kind of a kind of an odd time. However, um, when it comes to the clerics, uh, they actually provide a very needed service to the, uh, uh, to the universe here. Um, because, yeah, for anyone who potentially missed it, there is a massive undead problem going on in the Ogre universe. Um, in fact, you probably see most of it going on in the uh, March, of, in, uh, March of the Black Queen there. Um, you see it somewhat in OB64, although they're kind of okay with it, but it's just, it's basically, like, medieval fantasy The Walking Dead, more or less, uh, as far as what's going on here. Um, because, yeah, the, uh, <laughs> the like, in-universe, if anyone dies and they're pissed off about it, they're immediately coming back as a ghost, or a zombie, or something along those lines. And, quite frankly, they never stop having wars, so... If you think about it, and we're going to look at the uh, overworld map here in just a second. Um, but yeah, even here, uh, there is a very, very regular uh, issue when it comes to uh, uh, when it comes to the undead thing. Um, because yeah, there's undead forests in every one of them, sure. Um, but, actually, let's go ahead and uh, world back to a different location here. And yeah, this world system's fun. Let's go ahead and... Uh, da -da 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 -da. By the way, if you didn't know, yeah, Square Menu works here too. Why not, you know? Let's go ahead and move over here. This by Chapter 3. We should have everything unlocked. Uh, oh, and by the way, if you didn't know how the timeline works in World, uh, basically every time that you reach a new anchor point, it overwrites the uh, uh, the previous uh, time that you were there. Um, however, it only overwrites it up to that point, so you do have to go through pretty much the entire thing in order to fully rewrite your timeline. Um, which unfortunately comes with the side effect that, yeah, if you rewrite the entire timeline, you do have to do Coda again. Um, specifically Coda 2 and... Oh boy, yeah, Coda 2. That's, uh... That's some suffering and a half. But okay, so let's take a look at the map here, right? So you got, you know, civilization, civilization going on over here. Nice peaceful area over here between these towns, so this coast is relatively safe. Monsters completely inhabit this area. You got, uh, like, bandits, undead, and monsters in here. You got random bandits roving around here, but you got some civilization hanging out over this way. Zombies, 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 <laughs> all the way over here. Um, over here, you got a mix of uh, all kinds of nasty things. Um, basically, a mix of, uh, well, uh, bandits, undead, zombies, what have you. Uh, and then just kind of goes all monster crazy over here until you once again run into more zombies over here. Like, there's basically a massive undead problem, and again, while anybody can go and buy exorcism scrolls, that crap is expensive. Meaning that the only classes that are able to naturally use exorcism would hold some pretty high-ranking offices for being able to take care of all this stuff. Um, in fact, going up up here, uh, the Bakram are the only ones that really seem to almost have their undead issue under control. However, if you didn't know... Uh, over here, uh, the Vanessan Way, and man, oh man, I really hope that this spawns first try, because it's it's kind of a pain to get to spawn. Um, but if you didn't know how to get Knight Commander Marks the uh, without actually having to go through the story multiple times, um, there is a particular spawn in the Vanessan Way. It only happens when it's raining um, for, uh, uh, for dead Templars. So I'm going to go ahead and skip this. Which, by the way, if you ever needed to get more Princess or Lord Marks, uh, you just world back to this particular spot. And you can repeatedly do it that way. Now, if it's raining here, if it's raining, there will be some dead Templars hanging out in the rain. Proving that, once again, even they have to deal with the undead problem. Ah, oh, it's, it's a bright day. Ah, Alright, well, that's fine. We can potentially make it rain and come right back. So let's go ahead and go over here. Uh, can she use these? I don't believe she can. Yeah, I don't believe she can. Alright. Let's see if anybody has Field Alchemy on them by chance, because again, it would be 
it would be a different skill in this uh, particular save file. And unfortunately, no, that, that is a no. Oh, actually, one more cool thing, if you didn't know. There actually is a calendar in the game. Um, now I know what you're saying, yeah, yeah, duh, of course there's a calendar. There's always been, you know, that little time thing on the bottom right. No, I mean, like, there's actually a weather calendar. <laughs> Um, so, you might say, also, yeah, duh, of course there's a weather calendar that, you know, it's going to have different kinds of months and whatever else. But, there is, like, legit an actual weather calendar I over here in the uh, in the guides. So, uh, uh, is it here? Is it here? I don't know, it's one of these. Uh, here we go. It's going to be so along these lines. Somewhere in here. Like, I literally have a screenshot of the thing, yeah, the Zidginian calendar. There we go. So you zoom in, and yeah, sure enough, they actually let you know what the <laughs> what the different weathers are going to be like. Um, but uh, but yeah, just kind of a funny note there. Um, all right, because yeah, there's there's so much, you know, there's so dang much um, all over the dang place. Um, all right. So next up, did you? Uh, so not many people go through the neutral route, and a lot of folks wonder why the hell I love the neutral route. So there is a uh, an interesting thing that happens on neutral. Um, it's like everything about neutral is kind of like a failed redemption arc for some of the worst characters in the game, which personally I absolutely love because like everybody's trying their best, but they feel so hard. It's hilarious. Like okay, you know Hector, how he's usually a hard boss fight on both law and chaos. On neutral, you know what happens on neutral? Let me see if I can show you, because on neutral there is a. Oh, please tell me the save file has it. Um, there is, in fact, a unique fight that you can get. Uh, here, is it? here, that's chapter 4. We need chapter 3. Alright, now we got chapter 3. Now it's going to be that one up there. It should be... Now that's going to be Law. Okay, poor Aceton. Should be right here. So yeah. You actually fight Hector at the very start of Chapter 3 instead, and it's literally just an execution. Um, it's it's a really weird, like, for some reason you, the anchor point is right after this. Um, but yeah, basically what happens is it's in the rain, it's guaranteed to be in the rain. It's Hector and his usual squad, uh, minus the monster units, that are going to be there with basic starter gear. And it's basically, uh, Leonard just tells them, like, hey, so you get a chance to fight back. You don't really have a chance, but hey, at least you can go down swinging. Like, it, it's such a weird, poignant moment, you know? Um, anyway, so that's one of the reasons that I love neutral. It's so many things like that where it's like everything's just flipped on its head. It's pretty cool. All right. Uh, what else is cool here? So, um, the... Uh... Okay, so another fun note. Did you ever notice that the prices in the shop, and specifically the sell prices, are actually entirely dictated by how useful they would be in the market? I know this is very weird, like, I... I... <sighs> okay, so if I go over to the sell menu here, let's uh, let's notice something. Okay, so we go down the list of fists here, All right? So we go down, and okay, you get these uh, bronze ones, they're pretty expensive, the iron ones are more expensive, you get to the uh, the more expensive stuff here even more expensive, but people are still making these up until the Damask ones, and them things are pricey. Then you get to the Dragon Claws, or your, like, Jamahonders, or just, like, all these crazy, uh, crazy things that you made, or that, uh, like, even right here, you gotta go down to the bottom of the Palace of the Dead, and it's the equivalent of some bronze knuckles. Why is that? You know why? Because these ones have brand names attached to them. I like it, it's just it's funny. So if you didn't know, kind of back in the day, um, uh, kind of way back medieval times and whatever else, if there was a maker's mark on something, it tended to be more expensive. You're making these or finding these, they're not going to have a maker's mark on them, meaning that their actual value will be completely lost on people. Um, meaning that until you get to these super unique ones, no one's really going to be willing to pay much for them. In fact, uh, the uh, like going down the list of fists here, uh, the rays here are going to be your most, uh, are going to be your most valuable item, and, well, yeah, literally supposed to be a gift from a god, <laughs> and it's still worth about a third of the price of the, uh, Damask Claws. It's just, it's such a cool, uh, cool thing, you know? It's like upgraded versions, sure, they go up in value, but, uh, it's just cool that, uh, yeah, the market would not realize the actual value of these crazy god weapons. 
Um, cause yeah, they, they don't know where they came from to them. It's just like, Hey, this is a weird looking knife. What the hell? <laughs> so yeah. Also, by the way, did you know that there's a, uh, unique pumpkin that can actually break the text limit? Uh, so if you're doing the, um, and I, he doesn't really get a, uh, an entry or anything. And I don't believe I have him hired on this particular save file. Um, but there is a pumpkin named Pumpkin Stoffelies uh, that you can uh, that you can get during the Neb side quest. Uh, you can recruit him uh, with uh, with Control Golem, and uh, yeah, sure enough, uh, the guy's named Pumpkin Stoffelies. I don't, I may be wrong in this, but I don't believe you can actually ever name your own dudes that. So it's just kind of a cool touch. Um, another thing um, that's very oddly specific uh, that I gotta appreciate as a um, as a little historical nod here. Um, you may have wondered at some point why on earth it is that the short bow plus one has a stun effect on it. Like it's a weirdly good effect. It's very cheap to get a hold of. Why the short bow? Why? Well, the short bow is uh, is basically a hunting bow. So if you didn't know, back in the day, um, there were there were essentially rules uh, when it came to people going and uh, hunting on the same lands as royalty, and they they basically point out that yeah, the Farampa uh, uh, woods there are essentially like a royal wood that suddenly opened up. Now, granted, it doesn't always follow these rules, but in terms of hunting on royal land and things like that, nobody was allowed to actually pierce anything. So there was a thing that if somebody fired arrows, the only sharpened arrows could be used by the royalty. Everyone else had to use blunted arrows, aka you get a, a short bow that stuns. It's just it's a cool little uh, cool little historical nod there, very oddly specific. Um, but then again, it's this game. Of course, there's going to be a lot of oddly specific stuff, including things like, for example. Um, uh, you, the uh, the fact that there's a poisonous spear as well, a lot of folks just end up skipping over the scorpion plus one just because it doesn't tend to stick around for very long. But you know it is it is still it's probably one of my favorite spears in the game. Um, also, there's a bunch of weirdly specific uh, uh, element or not elements, but a bunch of specific debuffs in the game that never come up ever again. Um, did you know that there's a like spendthrift and paranoia that you run into only in Palace of the Dead? Um, like, for example, every time you take damage, that's how much money you lose. Uh, you even have items specifically to counter those things. Um, but I have wondered why on earth you would ever possibly need them. Um, which, yeah, it's uh, it's kind of crazy. Uh, so, uh, let's see, do we have them over here? I think I just saw it up there someplace. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't even see them here right now. But it's just, it's so very oddly specific, you know? Uh, so yeah, Spendthrift uh, just makes you lose money when you're hit. Um, paranoia makes you refuse to take healing. Um, you got Pain Aura, which causes a target to uh, take additional damage while also getting damage reflection. It's, yeah, it's kind of nuts. Also, uh, did you know that there's actually one enemy in the game that actually does use an upgraded plus one ring? And I believe it's the, I believe it's the first, uh, or the main knight that guards Heim. Um, I could be wrong in that, but I believe they're the one that dropped the uh, the Might plus one, if I'm not mistaken. Additionally, did you ever notice that the parry animation actually, even if they're using a shield, it will always use the sword? Yes, FFT did it too, but it, I just always appreciated that little detail. And, oh, actually, speaking of uh, more little details that pretty much never come up, did you know that uh, uh, Beastmaster's uh, uh, support abilities actually increase in range the more you rank him up? More than likely not, because almost nobody actually ended up using those things. But uh, yeah, the the uh, uh, the more that you use them, and probably uh, Gamp will end up having here. So like he's got rank uh, rank two here. Um, so yeah, range increases by rank. And uh, again, I'm sure um, I'm sure most folks didn't realize this, because who the hell is using power enough to actually boost it up? But sure enough, you know you can't actually boost it by rank. Um, additionally, did you ever notice that when it comes to crossbows, uh, pretty much the entirety of their uh, of their finisher setup is built as if it was a um, a uh, assault rifle? Very oddly specific, I know, but I I'm, I guarantee I probably wasn't the only one that uh, played through the other games with crossbows, like just using basic soldier guys and everything else, thinking like, man, you know, this is you could just go do a whole little like modern combat run and just. Uh, like you using exclusively crossbows and knives and then just trying to see what happens with that um and sure enough yeah that's that's absolutely a thing you can do um for some reason this save file doesn't have those unlocked let me get that corrected real quick so we go down to the bottom here we get gordon with the level one run uh, which yeah by the way this i know i'll i'll go back to this level one run at some point um 
Anyway, so if we go to the finishers here uh, for the crossbow, yeah, Brimstone Hail, basically a grenade launcher. Uh, Dull Bind, basically a leg shot. Death Whale, pretty much burst fire. And Sanctus Flare is a flashbang. Correct me. Just just try to argue me with me on, on that one. I guarantee that this entire thing was just modeled after an assault rifle. Um, anywho, um, another question that comes up pretty often is the fastest experience uh, that you can get in the game. Um, which is actually the desert map that kind of shows up over here. Uh, you can repeatedly world to it. You can repeatedly take that fight, uh, get a bunch of long-range uh, archers, snipe the lady once, done deal. Um, that's technically the fastest way to level up in the game. However, if you go to seven of the, if you bring seven of the same type of unit to Tynemouth, you're really getting a pretty good result there as well. Um, so just you know, bring seven of the same class. You can usually get them up. Um, it'll usually be seven. 11, uh, then 13 or 14, depending on a few things, and then you just kind of go up one level per fight from there. Um, generally speaking, there's really not much of a reason to grind past 25 until you get to, like, you know, uh, hanging or uh, floating ruins up here someplace. Um, so, uh, so yeah, there's that. All right, another thing. Then you know there's a, a, a reference to the original SNES, uh, SNES Tactic Soaker in, uh, in Hobberim. Um, so let me see if I have them over here. No. So, so yeah, uh, Habram has a, well, technically speaking, every, uh, Swordmaster has this, but, uh, two-handed katanas. Uh, you may have wondered why on earth Stonebloom exists, because it's kind of, you know, it's pretty random. Um, there is absolutely a reason for it, though. And let's see if, is Habram on this save file? Yeah, there he is. So anyone that's played the original uh, potentially might be familiar with the uh, uh, with the way that the uh, uh, katanas worked in the original. Well, not the katanas, but the sword masters worked in the original, um, in which uh, yeah, you um, you basically could give them a bunch of uh, uh, support abilities instead of their war dances. And yeah, Stone Bloom was due to the fact that uh, the Mr. Hobram here came in completely busted in terms of his agility. Which meant that uh, Petrify had a pretty much 100% chance to hit under most circumstances. Uh, so yeah, that's why he uh, he and all Swordmasters actually come with a uh, Petrification move as their as their main finisher, and that's probably why they're the only ones that can use them aside from the Lord. Um, so yeah, very oddly specific, but gotta love that it's there. Um, all right, what else here? Um, also, another weird note: Did you know this is the only game in the series where you see horses? Yeah, think about that for a second. There's two horses in this one. Vice is riding one of them. Um, uh, you got, uh, uh, got Lands riding the other one. This crazy demon horse situation. You ever see another horse in the series? There's a, like, there's a carriage in OV64. You never see the horse, though. So that could be anything pulling that carriage. Um, so yeah, it's unclear why. It's like I guess it's just assumed that horses would be kind of low tier in this particular one, that they're just a form of transport. And if they want to use anything in actual fights, you know, they'd probably ride around griffins or octopi or something. Um, so yeah, very, uh, very oddly specific there, but uh, just a fun little note. Anyway, um, I've got to go get some other stuff done now. This is, uh, that's all, uh, all we're doing for this particular one. So uh, I'll see you next time. You have yourselves an awesome one, and uh, yeah, see you then. Take care.